All right, Mr. Dave Asprey, you've clearly been working on your biceps. They look great. Yeah, I look who's talking here. So those biceps look great. These are adequate, except this one's better because it's got caffeine on it. Nice. <laughs> All right, so you're human. You evolve your stance on things. You have a scientific perspective on things. What are some things that you've changed your mind on over the last maybe five, seven years? And this might might piss some people off, but. Uh, you know, it probably will. Almost everything I do pisses someone off. And, <laughs> and the, the first thing I've changed my stance on is uh, if people were gonna be offended by something truthful that I was gonna say, I would try to soften it. And now I'm just gonna have to say, if something triggers you, it means you're carrying a loaded gun and that's not very polite and you should talk to a therapist. Like, I'm not gonna pull my punches. I'm not gonna be mean, I'm not gonna be unkind, but I'm gonna say the truth. And I learned this mostly from Joe Rogan. After he came after me for 18 months straight after I was on a show three times and when there was a financial motive for it. So I just learned to have a, We'll call it not a thicker skin. A thick skin actually hurts a lot because you can't, you're not flexible. You're carrying around like armor all the time. Uh, I just learned to, to have integrity in my word even more so and just to not worry about whether people like it or not. So it's not about you know making people mad on purpose or being a troll. It's just about caring about people enough that if some people get offended, the people who are my people who needed to hear it, they can hear it. And if someone doesn't like it, Things happen all the time that I don't like, but I can be at peace with that. And if they're not at peace, it's because they're not at peace. It wasn't my fault. It's a good perspective, man. I put a link down below for a probiotic that I would recommend. I've talked about it before, so it's no surprise. It's called Seed, but that is a special 25% off discount link if you want to try them out. I don't typically like probiotics. I like this one because they're different and they put their money where their mouth is. As I've stated before, it's got a capsule inside of a capsule. I highly, highly recommend if you're on the fence, you just try it because it's something that you will feel within a couple of days. Focusing on your gut health could be a priority for you, and if it is a priority, it could start changing how you feel. Okay, so starting with a microbiome shift by adding this into your diet, adding the good probiotic, adding the fiber in. So that link down below gets you 25% off. You will likely feel a difference within two or three days. It's that powerful. So again, top line of the description underneath this video for 25% off. It's difficult uh, even in my shoes too, same kind of thing you talk. It's, the thick skin, I like that <clears throat> that approach because it's for a long time that was kind of how I had to take it. Oh, I just have thicker skin, right? But it's like that's that's exhausting. It's you just ever have exhausting. Like one inch thick calluses on your feet. <laughs> you don't really want that, right? No dexterity. <clears throat> yeah, and, and it doesn't it doesn't feel good. Uh, and eventually, I got to the point where it it doesn't feel bad, right? And like one of the things that really makes people mad. A plant-based diet kills more animals than an animal-based diet. And I did not know this. I have been a raw vegan. I've been a vegan. And it was a Tibetan Lama in a remote monastery who taught me this when he pointed at the yak skin on his prayer pole when I was making fun of him for killing the animal. And he said, one death feeds everyone. I'm like, damn it, he has a point. And I went back and you eating a soy burger, how many small creatures were chopped up for your stupid soy that also creates suffering in humans when we eat it, right? And so you cannot look me in the eye and say, I care about animals and I'm gonna eat industrial fake food and not eat a cow. So this is reality and I'm going to speak reality. And if that's triggering for you, like seriously, I don't care. If you're triggered, you need to get a therapist because I care about you, but I don't care about your state of being triggered or not. That is on you. And if I can trigger you, you're not in charge of yourself. And that means your government can trigger you. That means Monsanto can trigger you. It means you're highly programmable and you need to do the work. And that's just reality. And that's my reality. And no one can take me out of it. That's a good perspective, man. I mean, because it doesn't matter what side of the coin you're on with that, period. If you're triggered, yeah. you got to do the inner work, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. Some of my favorite people are vegan followers who just ask questions, right? And when did we learn that all your friends had to vote the same as you? Like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Were you not allowed to have friends who are different religions than you? That's also stupid. So my life is richer because I have people who believe radically different things than I do. Like I was flying on a plane uh, the other night and I sat down next to this lady from New York who's a banker and we had zero in common. Like we were trying to find things, we both had kids. Other than that, there was not one single thing 
and I'm wearing like high end mountaineering pants. And she's like, I'm wearing fishing pants. <laughs> and, and she's like, I'm wearing my whatever design or whatever. And literally no shared entertainment, no shared values, no shared. It was the most fun conversation ever. Cause we're both like, what the fuck is this alien creature over here? <laughs> right. And that's where richness comes from. So if you can't be around that, like work on feeling safe, no matter where you are. Yeah. And eventually you'll find something wrong with even the people that seem the most like-minded. So if you're just sitting there waiting for that to happen anyway, you might as well rip off the Band-Aid and have the uncomfortable conversations up front. Absolutely. And also, if I really offend someone with lighthearted humor, now I don't have to invest my precious time in building a relationship with someone who's actually not open to a relationship of being friends even, right? So it, it's, uh, it's something I've kind of doubled down on over time. But there's other things that I've changed my beliefs on. And we'll get into some of the health stuff. Can we talk about sugar? Let's talk about sugar. Sugar's the devil, right? Depends on who you ask, I guess. Wow, what do you think? Depends on the sugar. <laughs> What's your favorite sugar? Ooh, pixie sticks. No. Uh, <laughs> you snort those too? Yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> um, if I had to pick one, I'd probably say, I'll piss people off and say fructose. Why would you actually make that your favorite just because you're a troll? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) No, Uh, predominantly because I like fruit, but not because the fact that, you know, I'm getting 100% fructose when I bite into an apple. You know, um, personally, I like a small amount of fructose. It doesn't spike my insulin. Well, of course it doesn't. Yeah. Fructose doesn't do that. It just exactly. spikes your liver fat. I mean, liver fat, you can't see it, so it's okay. Yeah, but if I'm going to be consuming a rampant amount of it and I'm also in a major surplus, then it could be an issue. But for me, I'm active. I'm metabolically healthy. I keep a close eye on my DEXA and my visceral fat, and I'm not having an issue with a small amount of fructose. But I'm consuming maybe 30 grams per day. Hmm, that's funny. That's the upper limit yeah. uh, on my recommendations from the Bulletproof Diet is yeah. don't do more than that. Um, so, okay, got it. Uh, what's your body fat percentage? Right now, probably six-ish. Got it. Same here. Six and a half right now. Yeah. So, okay. So it's working for you, but fructose generally isn't going to raise your body fat. It'll just break your metabolism if you do a lot of it. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that's your favorite one. Interesting. I don't know if it's my favorite. You put me on the spot. I don't know. Favorite sugar? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite sugar would be tree halos. Yeah. And honey? Uh, no, yeah. I don't think you can get it in honey, not in meaningful amounts. Yeah. You're only going to get it from a little bit of microbial fermentation or you buy it. Huh. But tree halos is interesting because it increases hydration in cells. You just don't eat it if you have clostridium going on because it'll it'll fuel it. Interesting. Uh, but it's one that I talked about in one of one of the episodes. It, it, they actually put it in some skincare products, but you can eat it. And in rats, but not in humans, it extends life by rehydrating part of the endothelial layer. But that's not you know that's not to say that I think sugar is good for you. But we've all demonized sugar, and starting you know going back to the very beginning of this. I would have said carbs universally make you fat because my entire life they have any carbs, I would get fat. And it was just, it was a problem. I fixed my metabolism and I can eat 300 grams of carbs a day. I quite often do. And I'm six and a half percent body fat and I don't put weight on. And that's because of a functioning metabolism, not because carbs make you fat. If you have a dysfunctional metabolism, carbs will make you fat. And what that means is it's the omega-6 fats that are the primary culprit. We can handle a lot more sugar than we do. I'm not saying it's good for us. I'm just saying it's not nearly as bad as we thought it was. It's the presence of bad oils and mitochondrial inhibitors in our diet and lots of sugar that's the issue. I'm not a fan of processed sugar. I'm just saying, would I rather have canola oil or processed sugar, yeah. an equivalent number of calories. I'll eat the sugar all day, every day before I'll touch the canola oil. Yeah, we're I haven't had, there. Yeah, yeah, I haven't had any canola oil to speak of, at least that I'm aware of, in at least 15 years. So I was a very, very early advocate of religiously avoiding omega-6s. So maybe other than from some avocados or occasional walnuts, I don't get omega-6s in my diet, um, other than the 1.6% present in uh, grass-fed beef, which is plenty. That's about all you need. Yeah, it's not very much. And you might be a good person to ask this. Since we're not having so much of the discussion anymore about omega-6 versus omega-3s and, you know, inflammation per se, you know, in the prostaglandin discussion, it's a lot more 
other directives, like we're talking about, you know, effect on the cellular membrane. We're talking about, uh, you know, how they affect endocannabinoid receptors. What are some of these reasons that omega-6s are problematic outside of just the old discussion about, oh, they're pro-inflammatory? I mean, let's get a little bit more granular than that. They inhibit your cell membranes from being able to express receptors very well. So if you want to express an insulin receptor through your cell membrane, it'd be nice if it worked, but they make the membranes less functional, which is a primary issue with them. And along the way, they create reactive oxygen species that just keep being created over and over and over. When they get, that's the exterior cell membrane in the mitochondrial membrane, which is where energy, heat, and a lot of manufacturing in the body happens, including things like melatonin and sex hormones or mitochondrial. When that gets inhibited, you are supposed to be taking 30 or so pounds of air and some energy substrate, combining them, making heat, electrons, hormones, proteins, the stuff that mitochondria do. Well, according to, let's see, in my longevity book, which is called Superhuman, 48% of people under age 40 have early onset mitochondrial dysfunction. That means they suck at taking air and food and combining them. It, it's like a dirty fire that makes a lot of soot versus a fire that burns clean and hot and bright with almost no smoke. That's how we're supposed to be running. And everyone over age 40 has mitochondrial dysfunction. We just call it aging, unless you've taken some aggressive longevity steps. And this is what happens when you have higher doses of omega-6 is you reduce mitochondrial efficiency. So there's more smoke in the fire when you're burning your food. Interesting. So omega-6s are worse than sugar. I would have told you 10 years ago that sugar was worse than omega-6s. Do you know much about the discussion on uh, omega-6s and endocannabinoids, like how they actually can potentially make you more hungry, affect kind of the ghrelin effect there? I know it's, it's who is the uh, the guy at UC Berkeley that's kind of the, the foremost kind of expert in that, in the endocannabinoid kind of range? It's... Uh, it's a little I, bit fringe, but it's interesting. I haven't dug in on a specific study involving the two. I mean, I know about ghrelin and leptin and yeah. all of that. Those are, are pretty well understood in the low carb space. And I'm I'm not a low carb guy. I'm a cyclical keto guy, yeah, but I'm sure. not a low carb guy. Um, what you find is uh, with endocannabinoids, there's a bunch of receptors. Omega sixes, I would I would believe would make you less able to express endocannabinoid receptors, but I. But that's, that's what just, it seems like. That's, that, that's, yeah. My knowledge would predict that, but I haven't seen a study that says yeah, that. I mean, everything's in vitro now, but it's still, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, right? Because yeah. it's, it's implying that perhaps some of the major drivers for overeating these ultra processed foods are a result of, you know, well, many mechanisms, but one of which is that. Um, so it's a, I asked Rhonda Patrick sort of the same question and because we have these discussions on the mitochondrial membrane, cellular membranes in general, and omega-3s being obviously beneficial for you know, membrane fluidity and omega-6s not being good for that. And I kind of asked her, well, what's more important, like lower levels of omega-3 or lower levels of omega-6s or higher levels of omega-3s? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in her opinion, it's higher levels of omega-3s, but that's really where a lot of her yeah. camp is. And it's, it's a it's, little bit dysfunctional. Well, and it's, it might be unrealistic for a lot of people to, to get adequate amounts of omega-3s especially if they don't know what they're doing. You know, I, I used to be an omega-3 fetishist. And I think Rhonda Patrick is going to evolve her perspective on that. Yeah. Um, there was a time, geez, going back, even right when I was starting the biohacking movement, where I'm like, oh yeah, you know, high quality fish oil will do three glugs. And you look at what excess omega-3s do, they also oxidize. And even if you look at Ray Pete's work, who's not, not all of his work is correct by a long shot, but he's got some very interesting perspectives on that. Too much... EPA and even DHA will oxidize and will drive systemic inflammation. So we have a classical case of if something is good, more is better. And I went down that path. Rhonda is still on that path. And she is going to realize that, yes, if you have an excess of omega-6, having an excess of omega-3 is better than just an excess of omega-6. But dropping omega-6 <laughs> dropping omega and dropping omega-3 together and still having adequate DHA and EPA around maybe two to four grams a day for most people is the upper limit. That's going to create the best inflammatory profile. Yeah. And you might say after a head injury or something, you might do excessive EPA DHA for a week or two, mm -hmm. but chronic elevated consumption of EPA and DHA omega-3 fats is not good for you when you take too much coming from a guy who has taken too much. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, in your perspective, it's much more about 
limiting the oxidation than it is the pro or anti-inflammatory effect. That supersedes mm -hmm. that in your opinion? It's not that you want to limit oxidation. If you limit oxidation, you suck yeah. at burning food. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> like that's how the body works, yeah. right? And oxidation is going to make either heat or electricity. And then you're going to use the electricity to make other stuff in the body, right? Um, so what you want to do is you want to limit reactive oxygen species that didn't come from making electricity yeah. or heat. And omega-3s in appropriate doses will do that. In higher doses, they actually make it worse. So I I worry because I did this, you know, 10 grams of EPA DHA a day. Do that for a while and you'll see like a sallow face, like sagging skin. It's not a great, yeah. it's not a great outcome. Uh, and I think we're gonna find, a, over the next three years, we're gonna find people realizing there is an optimal dose for omega-3s and it's not high. Uh, and there are some people who would argue that it's actually zero. And I've experimented myself with going, well, maybe they're actually bad for you because they're PUFAs and they oxidize really easily. And there's actually a lot of interesting corner case papers and research about that going, man, this is kind of scary. So where I ended up is the recommendations that I've had for a long time, which is phosphorylated omega-3s would be the best for you because they can enter the brain where you have the highest levels. I published the papers in my longevity book in Superhuman showing when you take omega-3s, where do they go in the body? Because it turns out different tissues change their fatty acid ratios differently uh, at different speeds. And so like your heart and your muscle and your white fat change entirely differently based on what you eat. And the tissues that are most susceptible to change in their composition are the brain and the white fat, call it your love handles. So you can switch that easily by taking more omega-6 or by taking more omega-3s. But you can't, when you go above a certain level, it's just not beneficial. So we're going we're gonna to see some, some interesting uh, movement in the other direction from where Rhonda is today. Yeah. No, it's an interesting discussion, man. Yeah. The whole world of PUFAs, there's just like, you just don't know where to really begin. You know, it's... I, it's where you're gonna end up is the safest thing is krill oil, which is what I've been recommending for a long time yeah, for because years, it's yeah. phosphorylated, which means it can go into the brain. And there's also a case for SN2 fish oil, which means when you eat fish, you get uh, the correct organization of atoms on it. When you take fish oil and you esterify or, or you process it, you're getting stuff that's not SN2, it's either SN, was it one or three? Uh, and you end up with a different outcome. This is the reason you might want to eat fish. The reason you wouldn't want to eat fish is you don't like microplastics and toxic metals. Yeah. And you know, and it's like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. For the vast majority of humans, it doesn't matter because you're not taking omega-3s anyway. Yeah. And if you are, they're probably rancid. So high quality cr krill oil is the safest bet you could make right now. And is krill oil gonna naturally be in a triglycerol form? I mean, it's generally not esterized or what? Uh, it's phosphorylated even if it is esterified. Yeah. Probably depends something on processing. I don't know yeah. the exact answer to that. I don't know either. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Let's see. Another one is let's talk about protein and aging. Okay. I've been in the longevity field for about 20 plus years. Uh, in my mid 20s, I started running an anti aging nonprofit in Palo Alto. I learned all the biohacking stuff from people in their 70s and 80s. Like my elders taught me when I was young and I had the diseases of aging. That's why I'm so passionate about longevity. Uh, and why I speak at A4M and other things like that. And it's it's a lifelong passion because I've experienced being old and I do not want to go back to that. <laughs> I don't want anyone else to do it either. So there's, for a long time, we've known that a couple amino acids that are predominantly present in animal meat raise mTOR. This is methionine and tryptophan. So people say, well, eat plant proteins because they don't have this problem mTOR, for listeners, is a compound that causes growth in tissues. Why is that bad? Well, because it might cause the growth of cancer. So from a longevity perspective, keeping mTOR low might reduce risk and it might extend lifespan and caloric restriction does that. So people came along, I suspect with some like inside agent from PETA or something, saying, oh, we need to reduce animal protein for longevity even though we don't have any evidence historically of that working. And so I looked and there is a, a bunch of research that's 0 0.6 grams per pound of body weight, uh, that there's some evidence for that. And I talked about that in my book. And I said, if you're 
over 60 or you're lifting, it needs to be 0.8 because you need more protein. There's another body of evidence that says about one gram per pound of body weight, which is where most people are today, including me. So what's changed in my belief is I looked at what raises mTOR. You know what else raises mTOR besides protein? Lifting weights. Um, surprisingly, no, that suppresses it. Yeah. yeah. Even uh, maybe at a global level, mTOR1c, isn't there a localized mTOR there, elevation? Oh, this, this is a fun one. All right, let's get to that. But first, I'm going to tell you what raises mTOR really, okay. really quickly and more than protein. Carbs. Sugar. <laughs> So you have all these people going, oh, no, animal protein, animal protein. And then they have freaking orange juice and it's going to raise their mTOR. So the only <laughs> thing you can eat if you're going to be one of these longevity mTOR lowering anti-animal protein guys is fat because fat and fiber, right? Yeah, but fat's bad too. Uh, amongst <laughs> some of those guys it is and the wrong fat is. But literally you're like eating butter and like grass or something. I, I don't understand well, how this butter. works. Uh, some of them would. Meat margarine, uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe excessive olive oil. <laughs> okay. All right, no, sorry, continue. <laughs> that's all right. Let's talk about mTOR. The way mTOR works in the body is it's like a spring. So when you suppress mTOR, it comes surging up afterwards. Right? So the more you suppress it, the bigger the spike is going to be. It, it's like you know holding off on something you're really anxious to have then you know you can eat all the whole bucket of ice cream if you haven't had ice cream in a year probably right so in the bulletproof diet i wrote about mtor stacking and that means do everything to suppress it all at once it's like compress the spring as far as it'll go so it's really going to surge forth when you're done and the three things that we know will suppress mtor are intermittent fasting or regular fasting coffee and weightlifting so what you would do is you would intermittent fast for 12 or 14 or more hours if you want to with coffee. And then you would lift at the end of your fast. Mm -hmm. Now your mTOR is like really, really compressed. And then after you eat, after you work out, eat protein and carbs and watch your mTOR go boom through the roof and you put on more. Now, some of that growth comes from insulin because the insulin like growth factor insulin makes you grow after you lift and you obviously know that. Uh, but what's really interesting about mTOR is it's the suppression ahead of time followed by the rising afterwards that makes it so powerful. Interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I guess it would make sense regardless of what kind of exercise you're doing. I mean, if you are, let's just say in a deficit because you're training, right? Whether it's an exercise induced deficit or calorically induced deficit, you're in a deficit, so you're phosphorylating AMPK more than likely, mm -hmm. which from my understanding, it's, I don't know if it's physiologically impossible, but you're not typically going to be phosphorylating AMPK while also simultaneously having a rise in mTOR, at least not at a global level. Yeah, um, it seems unlikely. Yeah. So, I mean, it would make sense. So I'm wondering, I mean, there's different types of mTOR. Mm -hmm. So are there various, because for example, stimulation of a muscle is probably one of the best ways to, well, obviously you need to have protein in place too, but stimulating a muscle is a, probably the largest driver of being anti-catabolic, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I typically recommend, I mean, you and I are both fans of fasting. Fasting, right. like one of the most important things you can do is use your effing body, like lift, use mm -hmm. it. If you don't use it, you lose it. If you're quote unquote starving yourself and you're not lifting, then you're not doing something, then yeah, the body's going to see that as metabolically useless, right? So, Correct. so remind the body that it should use it. So is there something that's triggering the body to say, hey, hold on to this muscle while you're fasting? If it's, and it's not a loaded question. I mean, is there something that's reminding the body saying, hey, is it mTOR related at a local level? Is it something mm. else? Is it flat out mechanical? Dur during a fast you're talking about? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's studies of how much muscle versus fat people lose on fasting, right? Mm -hmm. And people do lose meaningful muscle yeah. during a fast. Yeah. I think the length of the fast depends on the person and it depends on the day. That's true. That's a good point. And this is why I wrote the whole book on fasting. My publisher came to me and said, let's write a fasting book. I'm like, I already did. The Bulletproof Diet was like the first intermittent fasting cyclical keto thing. Like it's done. And they said, no, there's there's demand. And it's, I'm not writing a book that anyone's written before because there's tons of intermittent fasting books. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, you could chat GPT could write one for you right now. Um, but what was missing from it was the idea that you need to change your fast based on your state. And, and it's different for men and women. There's a whole chapter for women on what's going on with all of the studies that exist for fasting in women versus fasting in just people. 
And then I see people who are saying, well, if some is good, more is better. Yeah. And they do this for keto as well. And you end up like like Jack Dorsey. And like I have tons of respect for Jack. He's been a very early user of Bulletproof. Uh, and you know, public uh, statements about fasting. It's like, well, I'm just doing OMAD Monday through Friday, and then I do a 48 hour fast on the weekend. I'm CEO of you know a couple of companies. I know the CEO lifestyle, the circadian disruption that comes with all the flights, the stress, the board conversations, just the stuff. It's a very intense thing. It's in fact, there's a, a book called The Corporate Athlete that talks about stress levels and caloric consumption of executives versus athletes. Like the difference is athletes get to rest. So would I say that someone with the level of stress that Jack, when he was running Twitter and all, would have been under, um, and Square, <laughs> would, is fasting that much the thing that I would recommend? No, and if I'd had a chance to chat with him, I'd be like, man, maybe on Wednesdays you should have two meals, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's yes, fasting is good, but at a certain point you're kind of living on catabolic hormones because your adrenaline yeah. stress, uh, adrenaline and uh, cortisol come out. So it, I would just say, how am I doing today? What was my recovery score last night on whatever tech I use when I sleep? What's my heart rate variability? What's my body temperature? Is my brain working? If like, yeah, today's great. Fast. If like, I'm a zombie today. Maybe you should have an omelet. Right? And like, there's no moral difference between those. And perhaps in the past, I would have maybe defaulted to more fasting than is necessary. It's hard to say. I've also shifted a big part of the reason intermittent fasting works is circadian biology. And you know the glasses I'm wearing are from True Dark. It's one of the first circadian biology companies out there. And so it's not a change that I like circadian biology. It's just that light is the number one signal for circadian timing in the body. You wanna tell everything in your body that it's the middle of the day, turn on the bright lights in your bathroom and look at them for five minutes while you brush your teeth and it's the middle of the day and you scramble your, your body's timing. The second signal is food. This is why in the last few years, you've heard more and more people say, don't eat after dark, don't eat after dark. What I've been teaching is that the optimal time to have a meal, if you don't have a social life, is two. Because two billion years ago, and there's mitochondria floating in the ocean, they're measuring the angle of the sun to figure out what time it is. And then as things warm up, temperature also matters, but not as much as light, there's more algae. And then little mitochondria are eating little algae. Algae peaks around two because they got their most sunlight at noon. And then that's when the most calories are available. And then they start going down as the sunlight goes down, right? And this is the cycle of life for God knows how long before we had multi-celled creatures. So we're still following that. However, what would your life be like if you only ate between noon and two every day? Yeah. You probably, probably, probably wouldn't change much for me. Yeah, it might not. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. For, for most people, like the easiest meal to skip is breakfast. So eat lunch and early dinner and that works best, right? But in reality, you should maybe have a late breakfast and a, you know, end your food at two. I, who yeah. knows, yeah. right? But what I, I do know is that that late meal, even if you're intermittent fasting, is really not good news. Uh, and so I just stack light and then food. So I would say peacefulness around intermittent fasting where it doesn't have to be rigid it's based on your state and it's also based on the time of day to get the results you want i don't have jet lag anywhere on the planet anymore give me my true darks <laughs> don't eat when i want my body to think it's nighttime and then i don't get jet lag it's ridiculous take the glasses off and eat on the airplane and i'm a zombie the next day yeah all right to, to bring it back to the protein piece really quick and some mm. of the timing thing um would you say there's an optimal time to have protein to bring it full circle back to the mm -hmm. protein discussion and longevity? I believe that the one gram of animal protein per pound of body weight is the diet that is going to give you the most longevity because it's going to keep you from losing muscle. It also is going to keep you from losing brain mass. But, and this is a big but, it only works if you're supplementing either collagen or glycine because it's not the presence of methionine that's the issue. It's the ratio of methionine to glycine. And glycine is a beneficial amino acid. So if you take 15 grams of glycine a day on top of one gram per pound of body weight, you're going to have an optimal longevity situation. When you cut animal proteins out of the diet, you are automatically protein deficient because plant-based proteins simply don't work as well as animal protein. 
And it's not okay to say 100 grams of beef or whey or something is the same as 100 grams of gluten or soy protein or whatever other protein, pea protein that you think is food. They don't do the same thing in the body. And if you were to eat that many peas, you'd throw up. So you can't do that. So you industrially process them, but you still need probably twice as much pea protein as animal protein because it doesn't absorb as well. So you're going to do 200 grams of beef protein or 400 grams of pea protein, there's just a tolerability limit to it. It doesn't work. So creating malnutrition as a longevity strategy, i.e. the vegan diet, is a bad idea. I don't know if you'll like this one or not. <laughs> this is my most recent uh, my most recent work on exercise and all. I have believed for a very long time that the amount of exercise you do is the primary driver of how your body changes. So work hard, get results. Area under the curve. So do an hour long spin class, it's better than a half hour spin class. And about 10 years ago, I started saying, well, there's evidence for high intensity interval training. It's creating greater results. It still takes 10, 15 minutes, right? And it's it's more difficult, but it's less time. And the same thing goes for for you know lifting things, you know, more sets better, heavier, better. What I've realized is that for almost all biological systems that I can find, there's a new principle called slope of the curve biology. And this is a very sexy word that I made up or set of words uh, in the book. But what it means is that your body responds most effectively and quickly by measuring the slope of the curve, not the area under the curve. What does that mean to non-math people? How quickly you turn on a stressor and very importantly, how quickly you turn it off. So whether it's a muscle thing or a cardiovascular thing, or even a neuroscience training your nervous system thing, how fast do you get to the stress state? And then how fast do you come back? And the best thing for your body to change is high amount of nutrients. So you've got all your minerals, you've got all the protein you need, you've got enough energy, maybe from carbs, maybe not, but your energy is there. And then a stressor happens and you're walking through the forest, giant tiger jumps out, you run for 20 seconds, and then you're totally at peace, right? It's between the stress and the calmness. It's that signal that tells the body, oh, I'm safe and I have nutrients, let me adapt. But if instead you say, oh, that was just the first plateau, I'm on a spin bike. And you go to the next plateau, but it's like, I wasn't safe, someone must still be chasing me. So you just keep going and going and going. So now I look at what AI does, and this is all behind Upgrade Labs, which is a new franchise company um, that I'm running, owned in UpgradeLabs.com if you want to open a biohacking franchise in your neighborhood. But the idea here is, what if we do this for people who aren't even going to go to the gym? We can put muscle on three to five times faster than picking up rocks. We can do cardio, well, six times better in 15 minutes a week than an hour a day. So all of a sudden, it turns out you don't need to spend hours a week. And most people don't go to the gym. Like, I don't have six or eight hours a week to go to the gym, so I'm not going to go. <laughs> Give me a half hour twice a week, and you'll get so many more results than you would get in six hours. Oh, and you can train your brain, and you can do these other things, all based on AI and slope of the curve longevity and slope of the curve biology. So all of a sudden, I'm going to change the rate of my aging. Uh, so I, I've really shifted that way. And... Uh, I don't have the muscle mass you do, but I have adequate muscle mass. We have an equivalent amount of body fat, and I spend 20 minutes a week working out, and I'm flying all over the place. I'm on five flights in seven days this week, like relatively intense schedule with all kinds of stuff going on. And sometimes I work out a little bit more, but I'm reasonably fit. I'm reasonably strong. I'm working on some more functional movement things and whatever else, but would I work out more if I had more time and I wanted to invest in that? Yeah, sure. But it's not necessary to have a functioning body that's going to live a very long time. So what's the minimum effective dose? So I've become more about how fast can I handle it and how fast can I just go back to normal? Because it seems like that's the driver yeah. of adaptation. I can see that. I could totally see that, especially when you look at, um, I mean, for example, how quickly someone can get to... Uh, lactate threshold two or something, right? Yes. Like, like how quickly can you get there? Mm -hmm. But more importantly, how quickly can you come down, yeah. right? I've always talked about, uh, I'm speaking at CrossFit Health this weekend, and I, this is the kind of thing I talk about. Sometimes it irritates people, but like <laughs> my definition of, the Tom Stillauer definition of fitness is sort of, if you're running and it's flat, 
and you hit a hill, how quickly can you adapt to that hill? Mm -hmm. And then if you hit flat again, how quickly can you adapt back to the flat? And it's a similar discussion, which is talking about performance versus perhaps the longevity piece, right? I like to look at that. I like to look how quickly can the adaptation happen? And sometimes it's even at scale, right? Sometimes it's going to be, if it's a 15 minute workout, great. But how quickly can you get there? How quickly can you get down? If you're an athlete and you're training for two hours, same discussion, just a different scale. How quickly can you get to your peak performance and what you want to do within respective reason of mm -hmm. what you're training for? Resistance, aerobic, LT1, LT2, whatever, right? And uh, so I'm a firm believer in that because I also cool. feel like the body also responds very well to quickly to like a lactate stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. Once it has the signal, there's some preliminary evidence that's suggesting you don't need this chronic exposure to lactate. Exactly. Yeah, it's a quick it. it's a quick hit of lactate, and that sends the signal. It's a signaling device, and then and it's uh, I exercise a lot because I like to exercise sure. a lot. Um, I'm well aware that the minimum effective dose to keep my mass, to keep my strength, to keep my stamina is probably not anywhere close to what I'm actually doing. And if you love it, I'm not opposed to exercise. I, I'm a huge fan of it. I also just know like I'm a dad and if I spent more time working out, it's less time doing homework. Right. Yeah. And we're all, uh, we're all subject to that. I have more control over the shape of my schedule than a lot of people. Cause I'm an entrepreneur, but I have an enormous workload. Right. But I can move things around. Most people, they have a commute, they have a job, they have a commute and they have family responsibilities and they're trying to fit all this stuff in. Uh, and there's, there's things that just make it faster. So one of the things that I've, I've actually talked about in CrossFit specifically that I just love, and it seems like it's instinctive, someone will finish their wad and then they drop to the ground on their back and breathe. You're dropping to the ground and breathing to lower your heart rate faster. When you lower your heart rate faster, you're actually adapting faster. And that works better than sitting or standing afterwards. right? And it's simply how fast did I return to normal after this incredibly intense stimulus. right? And... I, I think that's underappreciated. So because I'm lazy, I'm like, well, what if I put someone through all this stuff and, and lazy, your body's lazy. It wants to save energy. That's how we don't die from famine. So my I work really hard and build big companies. I'm not that lazy that way. So I have willpower, but my body wants to save energy and time because that's what bodies do. And I just respect that about my body when I say I'm lazy. So what that means is you can go in and you can say, well, how do I make myself recover even faster than I could by laying on my back and doing deep breaths and visualizations? Well, let's throw in some red light. Let's throw in some cryo, anything we can to bring the body back to baseline faster than it would have. Now the body's like, that was weird. I swear I just got tortured, but now I'm okay. Yeah. And it's that, but now I'm okay. That's like, well, if I'm okay, I better build up. And so for most of the world, you're incredibly deconditioned. This is the fastest way. And if you're doing it because you love it or because it's part of your job or you're a professional athlete, your training regimen is going to look different. But I want your recovery to be intense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, at a certain point, you're, you're just stacking hormetic stressor on top of a hormetic stressor and there's not enough recovery in the world. Right. Yeah. Like I'm in a phase of my life this year for me, it's about finding that minimum effective dose. Good I've realized you. that between the monumental amount of training and stress that I would put my body through, not to mention being in a deficit, not to mention having two small kids, running a company. <laughs> like They'll teach us my little bit of, you know, cold plunging and sauna is not gonna not gonna solve it for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Like and there's not enough recovery modality that I could add into my day without saying, hey, I need to also tone back the training to make this a balance. Yeah. So I think that's we're definitely aligned on that, man. Um, Dave, where can everyone find you? Go to DaveAsprey.com or check out The Human Upgrade, which is my podcast. Right on, man. And you've got uh, your new book? My new book is called Smarter Not Harder. And my new coffee company, Danger Coffee. Nice. Because yeah. who knows what you might do. <laughs> we'll link out to all of those <laughs> below. Dave, thanks, my man.